Okay, so back to software processes. The plan for today is to finish off what we started uh, discussing about software processes. In fact, we'll, we'll discuss a little bit about agile processes as a, uh, in contrast with waterfall. And then we move on to techniques for uh, gathering and expressing requirements and specifications, which is something that you're working on for your, uh, for your semester project. So let me remind you, software process is the set of uh, the sequence of steps that you go through to, uh, to design and implement and test and deliver a, a software project. Um, and they are somewhat general, such that they are applicable to many kinds of software uh, projects. We've discussed the various <coughs> stages in the waterfall process. Waterfall is uh, a, an old software process, somewhat rigid. It contains many good elements. It contains, uh, it, it describes how you do requirements and specifications, how you do design, how you then put together uh, the pieces, how you do uh, testing. And then at the very end, we, uh, we discussed a little bit how this is done at NASA, if you remember. And there's a reading on the, on the class web page, which I, I want you to, uh, to read, that goes into these details. And I think it's somewhat fascinating, but also uh, somewhat sobering as to what it takes to build software that really has to run. Okay? And I think the last, the last slide that we saw last time was about the, the flip side of the waterfall process at NASA. It's not just you know, how few bucks you have, but how expensive uh, it is. And sometimes you know, the cost is, is worth paying. Other times, maybe not. So what I, uh, I want to now uh, discuss a little bit with you, what are the drawbacks of the waterfall process for all the good things that it can do, uh, for example, for NASA? What do you think are drawbacks, disadvantages? Yes. You have to wait a long time before you have your first complete iteration. Right. So it takes a long time until you see something moving the first time. And in fact, in waterfall, pure waterfall, you don't have an iteration. You wait a long time until it's done. Um, other disadvantages. Um, one small change is going to take a lot. Like, you essentially have to change a lot of things. Um, yeah, so change is difficult, but I wouldn't put it the way you did. I would say the waterfall process in its pure form does not allow for a change. Okay. And once you're done with the requirements and specification, you think hard about them, that's it. Uh, you have to go, you know, iterate. Other, these are, these are very important, and there are other kind of small things related to these. What's the disadvantage of taking a long time until you see the first, you know? Right, so you don't get the chance to get user feedback for a long time. You don't have like functional iterations as you develop the project. It kind of all happens in one step. You don't have a long time to learn. So, okay, why is that uh, bad? If you have a web application, then it's a lot more expensive. Right, so you can release, you know, essentially partially finished versions of the application and get moving with your uh, customer base. Yeah, th those are all good points. Um, so let's see what I have on here on the slide, uh, partially overlapping with what you already pointed out. Um, it's really a process that relies heavily, is predicated on being able to uh, assess early on what you need to build in the requirements and specification uh, stage. So this kind of implies that you know very clearly, uh, or, or if, you, if you think hard enough, you will know really clearly what you want to build. Uh, it takes a long time before you see the first working version, which again, it's not a problem if you know very precisely what your goal is. Uh, this is the time it takes to achieve that goal. But in many cases, when you can't know precisely what you want to build, you have very little opportunity to get feedback from your users to feel that you know, maybe you need to change something. Um, 
And uh, in fact, many of your users, they could in principle read the requirements and specifications and the design documents while you're not yet done with the product. But that's not good for most users. They, they need to see it uh, you know, working before they can, they can have an opinion whether this is what they want or not. Uh, the other problem is that uh, because it takes a long time for the spe specification and for the design to materialize into a product that one can actually use, there could be mistakes in the early stages that are then surviving to the very end and there's not much opportunity to use uh, actual testing to find those. Uh, so this is, these, are all, these are all problems. Uh, and in general, time, a lot of these issues that we point out to waterfall involve, it takes a long time until I have something. Well, time is very important uh, for a software process. Uh, and taking a long time, it's, it's very risky. Um, so w why do you think time is so important? What are the drawbacks of taking a long time or the advantages of, of, of being fast? You kind of pointed some. Uh, there are others. So over there in the back. More operational costs. Why is that? But presumably they do useful stuff. So if you know that that's what they need to be done, if it takes a year, you pay them a year. So in Agile, you kind of spread the cost out. Anyway, something else. It's because uh, your competitor may come up with your product, and your product first, and they launch to the market, then they go. Then by the time you come out, the market has already been on the market. Okay, the competitive landscape might have changed by the time you uh, you are done. Okay, you, maybe your competitor came up with uh, another solution. Other other thoughts? Okay, imagine, so you're now working on, on the semester project. And uh, you have to write this requirements and specification document. And this is a document for a project that's going to take a semester, okay, let's say eight more weeks. And in fact, the document is very specific that you should be precise about what you're doing first iteration. Okay, so I'm asking you to write a document about what you're going to be doing in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. So imagine that I told you now, you have to write a requirements and specification document for something that I will do in the next year. That's a lot harder to write. It's a lot harder to project how exactly this is going to work out in, in a year. And uh, in a real uh, business environment, you don't even know how your team will exactly look in a year. People come and go. Right? So uh, time is, is very important because in the short term, you pretty much know how the world would look. Uh, so planning for the short term, you have a lot of the environment kind of fixed. Um, your customers won't uh, change their mind much uh, in two weeks. <coughs> your competitors have not probably released much. Uh, your team is about the same. Research is about the same. Uh, software versions you have to work with is about the same. So that's a huge advantage. It's a lot easier to plan when fewer things are going to change. And that's true if you plan for short term. Uh, planning is a lot cheaper to plan for just two weeks. Trying to plan for a longer period of time, of course, is necessarily more work because you have to plan more work. It's for a longer time. But it becomes increasingly uh, less clear uh, what your assumption should be for what you're going to be doing in, in six months. And in fact, this is how people doing waterfall or even long iterations. Imagine releases of an operating system, okay? Once every couple of years, they're trying it once a year. That's a long time to plan what's gonna be in Windows 11, okay? Imagine that process. Uh, and unfortunately, the waterfall model does not, uh, in its purest form, lend itself to speed. However, it has a lot of the ingredients. We just need to change a little bit how we put them together. So I, I want to take a, a minute now to kind of show you one way to visualize the progress of a software project and to understand how you can play 
with the different variables that may influence a software project. For example, time, time is a very important uh, aspect, and in fact, it's a variable. Variable in the sense that you could, you could decide uh, in a project management kind of setting that you want to, uh, to take as long as it takes to finish the project, or you want to have something done in a month. That's a very different way to control time. But time is something you can, in some way, uh, control. Quality is something that you control, uh, directly or indirectly. If I want to do something in a day, well, quality is probably going to suffer. Or if I say, I'm going to take as long as it takes to get the quality to the level I want, that's another way to control quality. And scope, of course, is something very obviously under our control. Scope means how many features. What, uh, what is the list of features that this, this project needs to do? That you get to control. You can be less or more ambitious. The problem is, if you are too ambitious and you try to fix all of these, at the a priori kind of management level, you say, this is how much time we have, this is how well it has to work, and this is all it has to do. And maybe there's another, uh, the size of the team. And these are the resources. Now, if you fix all those, unless you're really lucky, it's going to be impossible to achieve. And if it's impossible to achieve, but you just still push it to your engineers to do it, uh, one of these is going to slip. And depending how your management style is, uh, you know, time may slip or quality may slip. Uh, so in, in general, uh, the easiest one to slip is the one that's hardest to, to measure because it just uh, deteriorates slowly without you noticing. Uh, time clearly we can measure, scope we can measure, uh, it's the quality that's a, a bit harder to measure, as we're going to see later in this, in this course. So the, the real solution is to be aware that you cannot always have all of these constraints met and let one of them be fluid. Insist on some, other, uh, on some of these constraints, uh, but let the others be fluid. And in fact, in agile programming, it's the scope that you let a little bit loose. You don't insist on the set of features, at least, but you fix the time, because you want to have something done in two weeks. You fix the quality, because obviously we want high quality. Okay? And you have a, a reach goal for the scope, for the set of features, but if you're not going to get there, you just implement fewer features. Okay? Is this clear? Okay? Don't try to over-constrain. Um, because you can't. And if you're not aware of which ones you are actually uh, being flexible on, you may end up with the, another variable uh, changing. So here's one way to, uh, to think about it. Uh, this is time kind of uh, going on the, the y-axis. And this is the set, of, uh, the set of features, let's say the scope that you are building. So in, in a waterfall process, you start with the entire scope of your project and you analyze it all and you spend some time and you're done with an analysis for all of the features. And then you design them all and then you implement them all and then you test them all. Now, one, uh, one thing you could do with Waterfall, you could say, I'm going to run two rounds or several rounds. I'm going to have an iterative uh, process. But the same, the, same com the same elements, except that at time one, I'm starting with half of the features and analyze them. It's going to finish faster than here because it takes less <coughs> work. I'm going to uh, design them, implement them, and test them. And then I'm done with one iteration, half of the features. And then I enlarge the set of features. I do another round of analysis, design, implementation, and so on. Agile, well, agile is not a precise term. But imagine it, it's just iterative taken to, to an extreme. Um, so you see we have kind of many iterations back to back with an ever-increasing set of features. Uh, because we're not very ambitious as to how much new stuff we add in, the, in each iteration, we can squeeze the time so we can go uh, faster. What's the question? What's the gap in the iterative model? 
uh, the gap has no significance. Maybe I should not have had a gap. Okay, it's it's, it's a vacation. I don't know. Um, okay, but so this I think sounds very reasonable at such a high level, but it has one one crucial advantage. So um, I said that time and scope are something we control, and here we explicitly were less ambitious on scope. But time truly, in some way, we can't always control. We can measure, but we can't always control. For example, it could be that like, if this is one year, halfway through the time, you know, money finishes. Something changes in the environment. The customer, we get a new customer, or we lose a customer. Uh, things we cannot foresee. And imagine that for some reason, we have to cut short this project at some arbitrary point in time that we can't foresee. So draw a line here, all right? Now, in a waterfall, you're out of luck. You have nothing. You have some paper design. The project is not finished. Nothing is working, okay? So pretty bad thing for having worked half a year. In iterative, if, you, if this is past the first iteration, you have the previous iteration, okay? So you have something. Uh, in Agile, it kind of maximizes how much you have, because if each of these cycles here, it's uh, two to four weeks, at most you have kind of wasted the last fraction of an iteration that you, know, you haven't finished, but you have something, you can reposition the project, you can you know, have some customers, it gives you a lot more freedom, okay? So, um, so the main reasons to use Agile is because gives you flexibility, you have partially done projects. At each of these stages, you can get uh, <coughs> feedback from your customer. Um, you can alter a little bit the direction of the project based on what you've learned about how it works out, how fast these things go. If this is the first time you're building one of these apps, you can't really foresee how fast this will go. A company like Microsoft, they can plan how long Windows 11 is going to go because it's not the first version of Windows that they Okay, but for uh, for most teams, uh, you you can do that. Any any questions? Okay, so agile programming. Let's see what it takes. Uh, okay, uh, it's more than just this. It's more just that putting waterfalls next to each other. You have to do it a little bit differently. Um, okay, but the good thing is that the ingredients are the same. It's just that we have to alter each one. So gathering requirements and specifications, same as before, same kind of steps, same kind of mechanisms that you use. However, you, uh, you, from day one, you recognize this is not a perfect job. It's not going to be your full set of requirements, uh, which means that you're prepared to stop at some point before you are done before you know that you have all the requirements, because you have enough for the first iteration, maybe the second iteration. There's no point in, in trying to plan it all out, because you're getting diminishing returns, because you're planning for something that's far in the future, and you don't have uh, much information about that. And then you recognize that the set of requirements may change once your user sees the first iteration, once your uh, product manager sees the first iteration, your management, whatever. Uh, okay, so, so the other thing you do is not only are you prepared to stop kind of before you are done, but constantly you think, as you collect requirements, which of these is more likely to change? You're trying to kind of allocate some sort of, uh, or assign some sort of uh, probability or likelihood of change. And it's worth marking those down as you write them, because, um, it's true that we're being agile here, but we, we know we actually have to deliver the whole project eventually. So the earlier we think about what might be the uh, places that we need to change, that's the better. <coughs> then you move on to design. And I will say a few more things about design. But for now, design, in the design stage, you design for the requirements that you have collected so far. But because you already have started thinking which of these may change in the future, in the future iteration, you are designing to account for change. Okay? You know you're not designing the full project. You have some uncertainty in a certain part. There are techniques for design 
that will make it easier for you in the future to change the design. Okay? If you if you try to foresee places where you may have to change. In the implementation, uh, as before, you do the critical pieces first. You realize you're not going to be able to implement it all. But you want to finish fast because perhaps you want to get some customers going. You want to get customers looking at it and give you feedback. So which are the parts that need to be implemented first to get most of the feedback, to get most of the customer initial customer base? Perhaps you have a competitor that you're trying to beat to market. What are the features that you need in the first iteration with respect to that? Okay. Uh, one thing that is very important in all software projects, but in Agile specifically, because in Agile you know things will change, is to not optimize uh, prematurely. Okay? Don't try to think too hard ahead of time where is going to be a performance bottleneck, because likely you're not going to get it anyway. <coughs> and uh, the implementation will change, perhaps, uh, for other reasons anyway. So you kind of uh, are postponing some of these kind of uh, fine-tuning of your application, because you know you're going to be coming back and iterating. And of course, um, if you don't have time to implement all of the features that you expect out, even design, leave them for the next iteration. This is a great thing about Agile. You know when you're releasing the next iteration. You don't quite know what's going to be in it. But, um, and then, then you iterate. Okay? You show the users or the customers the prototype. You collect, uh, you collect data, perhaps uh, through an interview, or perhaps you're doing A-B testing. This is very common nowadays where companies iterate um, on a design. And then, then they uh, release it to half of their users. And they collect data to see who comes back to the site more often. Is there a correlation between the new feature, you know, the button being red or green? Um, then you go update the requirements, update the design, and uh, keep going like this. And typically, you have the, these cycles between one and, and four weeks, or even shorter. Uh, at Conviva, um, in the early years, we used maybe uh, an eight-week cycle iterative, uh, and we thought that uh, the problem was that we always missed the cycle. Because you're trying to plan for eight weeks, it's very hard at the beginning of the cycle to know exactly what you can do in eight weeks. So we always was nine, ten weeks, it came, became very fluid. Then we re reduced it to four weeks cycle. It's a lot easier to plan. Uh, it's a lot less likely that you need to uh, slip the, um, the release. And uh, then we said, OK, if it went so well, coming down from 8 to 4, let's, uh, let's try 2, let's try 1. Uh, the problem is that some of these stages, requirements, design, implementation, they take time. You can't just squeeze them uh, infinitely. For example, uh, some of your testing that you may have to do at the end of the iteration requires you setting up a data center with, new, with machines uh, configured in a certain way. That takes time. Right? So it may take a day or two just to do a smoke test of your system. So you can't always uh, squeeze it farther. So uh, at Conviva, we went down to two, and then we're back at three now. Uh, because two was too stressful on the, on the quality assurance team. Uh, it was just too frequently they had to change the environment, change the version, change everything that tested. OK? Uh, for some of the projects that uh, I manage in a smaller team, uh, we do twice a day cycle. Okay, very, very small. Uh, there's a small feature, there's a small bug. We go through all of these in, 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 in twice a day and uh, or, or half day. The big differentiator is, of course, the size uh, of, the, of the team and the project, but also the fact that we have automated testing. Okay? If, if you can have very high confidence that you push a button and everything gets tested in one hour, well, then you can speed this up uh, a lot faster. <coughs> any, any questions? Okay. So for your project, we set up uh, uh, iterations at two weeks interval. The first iteration is longer because you're getting started, you're figuring out what to do. Um, but afterwards, you get into two weeks iterations. And if you look at the schedule, uh, so on Fridays, you release iteration N. Uh, next Friday, 
we want from you updates on, uh, of course, you'd be, you'd be doing this uh, in a more continuous way, but we kind of sample. Uh, in one week, we want to see updates on the requirements and the design and everything else. And actually, we assume you have already started on towards the next iteration and then release the next iteration and, and so on. Okay. Um, but now Agile, it's not all great uh, news. There are some disadvantages to Agile as well. Uh, the biggest disadvantage is that you might not take uh, enough time early on to think through where you need to get. You may rush a little bit to, to the first iteration uh, with the design, with the requirements that are missing some important part, uh, or the design that's missing a, uh, an important part. The worst would be to start with the wrong architecture um, and only become, in you know, iteration three, it becomes clear that to implement the next, what you thought it's just the next feature, you need to kind of redo it uh, from the beginning. So that, unfortunately, it's a, it's a drawback. If you, if you have experience in that kind of project, you can sometimes foresee uh, those coming and start with the right architecture. Um, but that is a disadvantage we have to live with because thinking a long time as a waterfall, we know you may still miss an important consideration that you only discover when you go to design or even implementation. So uh, we just accepted that uh, this is a, we may have to throw away some work uh, in the agile. Um, now, how do you mitigate this, uh, all of this change that, that's going to happen in your project? So for one thing, uh, in the design stage, for Agile, you know you're not designing the whole project. So you kind of design for the features that you have identified for the current situation. And pick the simplest, simplest design that works for the current features. Um, in particular, do not try to optimize early on in the project. Optimize only when you gain enough experience with your project, with the way it runs, uh, that you can actually measure, you can do profiling, you can figure out where the bottleneck is. Uh, it's, uh, it's really too hard, I would say even impossible often, to predict where the uh, performance bottleneck is. And I'm not talking about a very small backend. Uh, if you have a backend that has many, many moving parts, databases that need to scale to a large number of users or tables, it's too hard to predict initially uh, which part of that database um, transactions will actually be too slow. You actually have to measure and see that. So don't, don't try to optimize prematurely. Just keep it simple. Furthermore, uh, how do you mitigate this expected change? You may already have an idea of which parts of the requirements, which parts of the design is more likely to change because you have thought about what features you may be implementing in iterations two and three. But uh, you want to implement something simple first. Okay? So find some critical <coughs> places in your code and uh, uh, put abstractions around the, the pieces you may want to, to change. For example, uh, let's say that you know you will need a, a database a highly performant database, but you want to start iteration one with a simple database, just so that you can start faster. Maybe it's a database you know already. Okay, so let's say you want to start with SQLite 3, which is a fine database for development, but not very good for, uh, for deployment. But you know you'll need to go to uh, MySQL, to Postgres, to Oracle, to whatever. Okay, so what you do, you avoid hard coding in your code SQLite 3 command. You build an interface, an abstraction, such that your code makes call to this abstraction to do generic database operations. The abstraction implements SQLite 3 for now, but it's a nice place for you to change the implementation to use MySQL later or Oracle later. Essentially, <coughs> isolate, abstract. Okay? So you'll have to do uh, this in, in crit critical places. You, you have to do it even with waterfall just to keep the code clean. But here you have to do it because you know you will change part of your code. And you don't want to have to uh, mess with the rest of your code. Okay. Any questions on designing for change? Um, there's another thing that you have to be ready is refactoring. 
Okay. In ideal waterfall model, you uh, you think that you know the requirements ahead of time. You think that you do a design that is good for your entire requirements. There should be no reason for you to have to rewrite your code. Throw away what you've done and rewrite your code. Well, in Agile, you will frequently have to re-implement stuff because you haven't thought it through, and now it needs to grow, and there's no room to grow. It was designed, written, perhaps, in a way that's not, um, not ready. So you have to refactor code. And uh, that's not bad. It's actually an opportunity. Uh, so let's plan for it ahead of time. So what is refactoring? Refactoring is a technique in which you change the way, uh, change the implementation while keeping the same, uh, the same functionality. <coughs> so you change only how the code does something, not really what it does, what features it builds, just how they are uh, built. So the code functionality should not change. Imagine this typically happens at the beginning of an iteration. You've just finished iteration one. You rushed. You cut some corners. You hard coded some stuff. It's kind of ugly but you want it out there so that users, customers can see it. In iteration two, you do a little bit of thinking. You need to now, you need to build another feature, and it's very clear that you cannot build on top of the, of uh, certain parts of your iteration one because they're too ugly, they're not ready, they won't support uh, this change. So the first thing you do in iteration two is you re-implement, uh, you redo some of your iteration one in a different way that will allow you to grow. That's, that's called refactoring. And again, you have to do it because you haven't really thought it through from the beginning. So you most likely have uh, had built some of it in a way that doesn't, doesn't grow. Uh, and some people say, well, you see, you should have thought more. And then you would not have to rewrite code, to throw away code. Okay, that sounds right, but uh, it's not actually what happens in practice. Even in Waterfall, even if you spend a lot of time thinking, uh, the first attempt at writing something might not be might not be the right one. So in Agile, we essentially say, you know what, there's no no point in trying to avoid change because change will have no matter how we think ahead of time. Here we embrace change and we're ready for it. We put abstractions, we plan, uh, we reserve some time for for throwing away parts of the project and redoing them. Um, okay. So uh, now, there's another aspect that comes with all of this change, all of this refactoring. Every time you touch a piece of functionality, the implementation, you have to worry that you're breaking it. Okay? So every refactoring really requires uh, testing. And uh, um, because it's likely you're going to break something. Now, if you think about it, in iteration one, um, Think about that diagram that I had with the set of uh, features growing as you go uh, over time. In iteration one, you have few features, testing them, it's, it's quick. In iteration two, you have to retest all of the features of iteration one, because likely you have touched that code, and the new features of iteration two. So as you go in future iterations, the testing burden becomes bigger and bigger. Uh, up to the point where you get tired of retesting the same feature of iteration one. But if you don't, almost certainly you will break it. You will regress. Okay? So, how do you think we address this problem of ever-increasing cost of testing? <coughs> yes? You automate the test. Okay? Uh, computers will have to do an ever-increasing amount of testing while you're you know, having your coffee or lunch, uh, but that's not nearly as bad as you having to click on the buttons for the same feature every two, every two weeks, okay? So automated testing, I say it's a mandatory part of Agile, okay? In Waterfall, you could say, I'm going to do manual testing because it's once. At the end, we test everything systematically once and we're done, okay? Uh, in Agile, you have to automate because otherwise you're gonna you're not gonna do it. You're just gonna do less and less uh, testing and you have more and more bugs. So how does agile implementation actually stage looks? Uh, you have a, a set of features to implement and you uh, you have some refactoring to do to support these new features. So if you look at the within the implementation stage, maybe that week when you're just 
implementing, you go through stages that are pretty uh, distinct. There's one stage, perhaps half a day, perhaps a day, when you pick one of these new features and uh, you implement it, and you write this automated test. So the automated test for each feature gets written along with the feature. And we're going to see a lot more of this uh, in, uh, later in the semester. Then when you are done, and all of these automated tests pass for this feature, you run all of the automated tests for the previous features as well. Okay? And ideally, for a project of the size that you're building in this semester, this should take a minute, uh, automated tests. Hundreds of automated tests a minute, that's doable. Uh, then you say, okay, now what do I do? Uh, I can move on to the next feature, or I can clean up some code to prepare for the next feature. If you decide to do refactoring, it's very important that you start refactoring when all of the tests pass because the tests are going to be your measure that refactoring did not break in. Okay. So then you start refactoring. Uh, the good thing is that in refactoring, you don't typically need to touch the tests, because tests measure what your code does. Refactoring is changing the underlying algorithm, the underlying data structure, the way you're breaking code into functions and modules. The same tests should pass with you the same way. And you refactor, and you keep running the tests, until you, uh, you're done with factoring, you achieve the structure you want, and all the tests pass. And now it's another one of those uh, points where you can decide whether to do a feature uh, push or a refactoring push. It's perhaps hard for you to appreciate, unless you've had some experience in industry or a long-running hobby project, it's hard to appreciate how um, how easy it is to break something when you refactor. Okay? If this project is not entirely fresh in your mind, let's say it's something you've written a year ago, and somebody uh, comes up with a bug report, and you say, I'm going to fix this bug, and I even know how to fix it. It's this condition that needs to be changed. Uh, you may not remember all of the <coughs> intricate corner cases that that conditional is supposed to handle. Um, so I had projects where it took me three iterations. I fix the bug and run the test and, and something breaks somewhere else because of my change. Okay, and then I go and say, oh, it's more complicated than I thought. I have to change it in a way that I fix the bug and keep this going the way it was. So second iteration, fix it, and then pop somewhere else if it's a complicated thing. And then at some point, you, uh, in this process, this is all takes uh, an hour or so, running the test, fixing, running the test. Uh, this kind of helps you understand all the ramifications of the change you're making because tests start to break if you are touching inadvertently other parts of the code. At some point, you understand that, okay, fixing here affects this and this as well. Uh, I have to do it in a way that kind of pleases everything. You do it, everything passes, that's when you're done. Okay? And ideally, actually, you have written a test to reproduce this particular bug because this bug got past your test, it means you don't have a test for that condition. And then you can put this project back on the shelf, come back to it uh, a few months later if you need to fix another bug. But if you don't write the automated test, it's going to be scary. Uh, it's going to be scary to touch complicated code because you're going to be aware that you might not understand everything, all the ramifications of the changes you're making. And either you have a testing uh, time to do exhaustive testing. We have a testing organization to do it for you, or you're going to be scared to actually uh, change the code if you don't have automated tests. So, um, I, I actually care a lot about testing, and uh, we'll have to uh, do some of it in in your projects, and we'll spend uh, several lectures on testing in a, in, in a couple of weeks. Okay, but with that, let me just conclude uh, about software process in general. It's important to uh, pick a software process, uh, a set of steps that you go through in writing your software, unless it's a really a toy uh, big project that takes a couple of days. And uh, there are, we've looked at the waterfall more as a way to introduce the, the actual uh, ingredients of a software process. It's not something that you actually use very often. Uh, more often you use iterative or agile processes where you kind of uh, go through the steps uh, more, more quickly. But the important part to realize is that 
if you do an iterative process, change, throwing away code, redoing code is going to be part of, uh, of life. And you have to prepare for it. And the automated tests are going to be what keeps your cost low and your sanity uh, intact. Okay? So there's, there are people who say, oh, I want to do Agile, but I don't want to do tests. That's just not a, a process that works. That's just laziness. Uh, it's going to break down. So that concludes my uh, software process part, and it's a good time to take a break. I'll show you a puzzle uh, while you're taking a break. Do you have any questions about uh, projects, quizzes, uh, deadlines? Okay, everything is clear. We're going to be going at about one quiz a week from now on for a while. The Smile project will kind of wind down. Uh, and they're not smiling. Uh, with the Smile, the, this last backend page, I Last, yesterday, I just pushed some clarifications for uh, instructions for pushing to Heroku. Okay? Because we wanted to keep the GitHub, have the GitHub repo that we use for part one, part two, part three. Part three is going to be on a special branch for part three. And from that repo, you can push to Heroku. You don't need to create a separate repo. Okay? But it, it requires a little bit uh, of a different uh, command to push. Uh, have you, has anybody here managed to follow this new direction to push to the Roku? Yes? No, there was, okay. okay. Yes. If you're already made a new repository, can you just keep the code identical to the previous version? Yeah, I guess you could. Uh, we will look at the GitHub repo if you need to look at the code and then run the Roku. Okay. Whether, how you actually push the code, if you carry it to the data centers and put it there. Don't care so much. Other questions? Um, so, 
Let me tell you about this problem. I was reading in a newspaper article uh, looking at the last few years since the 2008 financial crisis saying that the, the average income of families in the U.S. went up by 20%, but the median income went down by 20%. And that seems strange. Okay? The average goes up, but the median goes down. Uh, do you know what median is? The, the mid-family, uh, mid-income family, uh, halfway. Uh, so if you rank all the families, the one in the middle, okay? Do they make more or less? And apparently, essentially, more families make less, but on the average, they make a lot more. And do you know how this could be? I want more people to think about it. You, you, should, you read about median and averages all the time. And, so misleading. Right. So the average is very easy to manipulate with one outlier. So somebody makes a billion dollars, he's going to pull the average of everybody out. But it's not going to uh, move the mean. Right? Okay. So this is a problem based on this. Uh, this is actually another misleading thing. If you, you read this about investment strategies, uh, say, Invest with our strategy because um, in good weeks, you earn 80%, so 1.8 of what you had at the beginning of the week. In the bad weeks, you lose 60%, 0.4. And they tell, and there's, let's say there's no correlation of what's a good week, bad week, between week to week and between investors. Okay? And they tell you, they brag that you'll make a lot of money on average. Okay? So the question is to calculate the average and the median amount uh, investing like this for 52 weeks. There's lots of investors using this strategy. Um, so let me, I'll give you the answer in, uh, okay, do you have a sense? And, uh, but I, I want you, if you're interested, to, uh, to follow it up uh, and, and try to calculate. Do you have a sense what the uh, answer might be? <coughs> Is this a winning strategy, a losing strategy? On the average, uh, it is a winning strategy. Okay. Why? Uh, if we look at probability, we just do expectation. Okay. Yeah, so even because it's 1.8, uh, it's a multiplier for the week when you win. And then let's say next week, uh, or you, you say average, 0 0.6. Is this how you calculate it? 0 0.4? 0 0.4. Divided by 2? 1.1. Okay. Yeah, so what would you say in 52 weeks if you start with $1,000 on average, how much you have? Uh, it's hard to guess, but it's 140k. So, whoever advertises this to you, they can legitimately say that on average, at the end of the year, you start with a thousand, you end up with 140,000. So, something you should try. But what's the median? Most people, how much they end up with? Okay, it's 19 cents. So, on median, so the average investor will make 19 cents. I mean, we'll be left with 19 cents from $1,000 at the end of the year. But on average, it's 140K. So uh, try, to, try to calculate it. If, if you want, um, I'll post it on Piazza, the, the actual text, so you can think about it. OK, so don't uh, follow up these investment new letters, newsletters without understanding what they are claiming. Okay, let me move on now to, uh, to another part of the, of the course. I have, it's about the lecture and a half on requirements, specifications, uh, unified modern language. Okay. So what we had so far, if you think from the beginning of the semester, we had a bunch of lectures trying to cover the web applications, how you, how you build them. Then we said, oh, uh, we build these web applications uh, 
in a very unstructured way. How do you structure? Um, so that was a little bit of a design, software architecture, and I introduced model view uh, controller that way. And the reason I kind of front-loaded that part at the beginning of the semester is because I want to get you started with the SMILE project and with your actual own projects. Uh, but then, after I took care of your projects, I stepped back and said, okay, let's forget about web applications, about SMILES. Uh, let's look at more general issues about how you actually build software. So that's when we started software processes, waterfall, then, uh, then the agile. And now, in, in the same spirit of trying to look at the, at the big picture, I want to talk about how do you gather uh, requirements and specifications, and more importantly, how do you actually express them? And this is something I will uh, expect you to do for your requirements and specification uh, document that you're writing. And then again for the design document. Both uh, UML, to define modeling uh, language, and, and the rest I'm going to show. Yeah. Okay. So requirements in some way, even though you may not think it uh, so, it's the most important part of, uh, of building a software project. Because no matter how good your development team is, if you don't tell them to build the right thing, right being what the customer needs, what's going to make your business successful, then they're going to be building something that you don't need. And that's a complete waste of a, of a great uh, development resource. And it's actually pretty hard to rectify later, to change it, if you haven't, uh, you don't at least have a pretty good idea. Okay. Furthermore, the way you do requirements and specification gathering has to be tailored to the process you're using. If you decide to use a waterfall for whatever reason, maybe the cost of failure is, is too high, then you have to do a very extensive requirements and specification analysis up front. For Agile, you have to have a process in place, but you can start with a partial set of, uh, of requirements. Um, actually, let me... Okay, moving along. Um, okay, so the first thing you, you need to do when you gather requirements is to uh, determine uh, the stakeholders. Stakeholders is just a generic term that includes everybody who has an interest in your system. Uh, users, uh, customers, and you should be uh, aware that sometimes the users are not the customers, right? When you do B2C, business to consumer business, like uh, you know, Facebook, uh, your customers are often your your users, the ones who are using the software. But when you do a uh, B2B business, like, like Conviva does, we build libraries uh, and tools that we give to another business that uses them to create software for the user. So the end user is somebody watching your video, but that's not who pays us. The actual customer is this person who integrates our software and uses some of the data that we provide. You have to understand all that, and you have to prioritize and figure out, essentially, uh, what each of these stakeholders need uh, from the software. And these may be different, uh, different needs and points of view. The users may be uh, willing to watch video without giving too much of their uh, uh, history data. Okay? The customers want the data. Uh, they give you the video, uh, but they want the data. So you have to find the right balance for all of these. In agile programming, it's very important to have a, a close relationship with the customer. Uh, ideally, the customer should be part, part of the team. And this is because you're going to need to uh, consult the customer quite, uh, quite often. Uh, you will need to reiterate the requirements every cycle, every two weeks perhaps, so the customer can help there. Um, you will see that the customer can actually help to uh, write and actually run some of these acceptance tests. At the end of the iteration, you can give it to the customer and say, verify that I have implemented what we, what we agreed. Those are acceptance tests. Uh, very often, you can't implement everything in one iteration. So who's going to help you prioritize what to implement? The customer can help. And again, evaluating intermediate versions and then deciding what needs to be changed. Uh, those of you who actually have an external customers for your semester project, you should really be in close contact with the customer. 
uh, more so now in the beginning because there's, there's a lot more of this verification requirements, but after every iteration for sure. Uh, I will show you two techniques, yes. Could you uh, go more into depth on what is an acceptance test? Yes, I will. I will describe what is an acceptance test. Uh, that's a little bit of a forward reference to a few slides for it, okay? And other questions? Okay, thank you for the question. All right. uh, I will show you two, um, two, two ways to express uh, requirements that I have found to work reasonably well. And I would like you to include both of these in your, uh, in your documents. Um, one is called user stories. User stories are an electronic version of index cards, so essentially small pieces of paper that you can spread on a board, pin uh, to a board, and organize and prioritize. Uh, on each of these, you have to have a title, and this is how you're going to communicate about these, uh, uh, these user stories. And it's a relatively short description from the user perspective, whoever is using uh, your software. So I wrote here customer-centered, but it really should be user-centered. And I'll have examples in a, in a bit. It's important to realize that you are in the requirements stage, not in the design and implementation stage. So don't get uh, too much or not at all into how this thing is implemented, but really what it does, how does it feel to the, to the actual user. And they often try to use a language that clients can understand because if you do have a contact, close contact with the customer or a user base, uh, they should see these before you're implementing them and help you prioritize them and refine them. And again, there's no need to have all the stories in one iteration. So for your document in two weeks or a week and a half, we will want to have some user stories in detail, the ones that you plan to implement in the first iteration, but maybe not, not all of them. Let's go to an example uh, of a specification that will turn into user stories and acceptance tests. So let's say that the customer says that I need an accounting software to create named accounts, to list accounts, query the accounts balance, and delete accounts. Okay? So the first thing you do uh, is you analyze the customer statement or whatever interview you had with the customer and you start creating some user stories which you then present to the customer to, to kind of validate. So for example, we're going to create, uh, I'm going to break that statement from the customer into several parts and we need a create account uh, user story and in the description I can create a named account uh, the customer also wants to be able to list accounts, so that's that's another user story. That's another use case of your software. I can get the list of all accounts. I can create the account balance, and I can delete uh, the account. And this, so far, all I've done is I've taken that English uh, statement and split it into uh, into separated into separate user stories. And I kind of copy there the English description of the user story. But this is just the beginning. Uh, one thing that you do uh, here is you take the statements from the customer and try to force the customer to elicit more precision from the customer because uh, your developers will need more precision than this to actually implement it. And uh, it helps here if you understand a little bit the user domain, um, let's say banking in this case, accounts, because you may ask the question, okay, you want a list of accounts. Well, how is this list going to be presented to you? In what, in what order? And uh, then the customer says, ah, yeah, I forgot to say. Uh, I mean it sorted alphabetically. And then say, uh, well, you want to delete the account. Can you delete the account uh, if it has a non-zero balance? And the customer says, oh, I forgot to say. Uh, only if the balance is zero. So you have to first do a transfer, I guess, before you can enable this uh, user story. And... Uh, um, Okay, sorry, I went, I went a little bit too fast. Do you have any questions so far about user stories? Okay. So the idea is that you, you keep you know, putting more precision in the, use, uh, in the description of user stories to the point where you can start to kind of imagine how it's going to be implemented. This is not a design document, but you have, you as a developer, you have to try to bridge the customer wishes with what it's going to take uh, to, to implement it. Quick question, and, but yes. So to what depth, or not, not depth necessarily, but like how 
how in detail you could create data stories, to cover every possible scenario, to just cover a handful of, like, how, how do you go about that? The, the user story should cover every possible scenario. Think about it that you take one of these and you give it to a sub team or a developer, and they should be, they don't they shouldn't need to talk to the customer. Okay, so you try to foresee what questions might come up during development in terms of how it should work. And if there is ambiguity, uh, it should be spelled out uh, here. And when we get to acceptance tests, you will see that those try to help with us. Okay, so it's it's, it's a supplement to the user stories. Uh, uh, more extensive user stories will have exceptions like in what cases it aborts and how it behaves when it aborts, uh, and so on. If you go back to our SMILE uh, part two specification, those were in some way user stories. Now we're implementing liking a button, how it should look to the user. Uh, you click on the button and it shows, this shows, this comes. Uh, this is the case, these are the cases when you get exceptions, and, and so on. I do want to provide an example of something that's not a good user story, because here the customer or the developer may say, okay, use Ajax for the UI, and the description is the user, the user interface will use Ajax technology to provide uh, responsive uh, online experience. The reason I'm saying this is not a great user story is because it really borders on being an implementation user, a design, more so than, because truly the a user doesn't care that you're using Ajax or not. Ajax is just one particular mechanism for the browser to communicate with the server. So it's important to keep implementation details out of user stories because you want the user stories to be somewhat independent on how you're implementing it, both to give freedom to the developers to pick the right technology based on other factors like what the server supports and so on, as opposed to have it kind of uh, fixed in, in your requirements. Uh, although, although, again, I want to pass, I said generally here because sometimes a particular uh, implementation detail is a requirement. Can, can you think of an example when the customer may come and tell you that you have to use this implementation uh, strategy? Mobile application. What way? Mobile application. Okay, yes, that's an indirect requirement. If they say, I want the UI to run on iOS, well, some of the implementation is fixed at that point because the language for iOS is, is fixed and so on. Um, more examples? Um, like government might require some sort of security protocol for their encryption, like they want SHA-1 and not any other type or something like that. Yes, very good. When it comes to security, uh, it may be actually a requirement that you use a particular way to implement, I don't know, to store passwords and so on. Yes. Um, if the customer is integrating your product with one they already have, and that one has specific uh, protocols. Yes, very good. If this is not a standalone project, you have to work with the Oracle database they already have. Let's say it's uh, it's a requirement. Then you had another one in the back. Yeah, yeah it's similar. Similar. Yes. Okay. So. These are not black or white rules. Just try to use judgment and try to kind of filter out things that maybe that don't belong uh, here. So what's the next level down from user stories? Or, or uh, what can you do with the user stories before you actually start designing and implementing them? And uh, it's a very useful technique that's used in, uh, in agile uh, programming, but in any kinds of software project in general, is acceptance tests. These are some, uh, you take the user story and you concretize it. You create a concrete scenario of running through that user stories with actual names of accounts and amounts in the account to make it, uh, make it concrete. So let me, uh, let me show you uh, an example that goes with our account, okay? So you, essentially you're spelling out a concrete testing scenario of when this user story will be implemented. Uh, if I create an account savings, and then I create another account called checking, and then I ask for the list of accounts, I must obtain checking followed by savings. So this ties in with the create account and the list accounts, and puts them together, tied, in, tied with some concrete data points. And notice that the alphabetical 
order is implicit here. Um, okay, so it also very explicit uh, the, the actual names of the accounts you're using. And then you go on and say, if I now try to create checking again, I get an error. If I query the balance of checking, I must get zero. So now you're tying this uh, scenario with the list account balance. And implicitly, you see, from here, you're going to be able to go back and refine the story for creating the account and say, well, I must have created it with the account with the balance uh, zero. And if I try to delete this account stocks, which I haven't created yet, I get an error. And if I delete checking, then if I run another list of accounts, it doesn't appear in the list of accounts. So the list of accounts should be saving. So these are really testing uh, scenarios that are very concrete. This is something the customer can understand. Say, yes, this is how I will test your software. And try to get this down pretty precisely early on. It becomes almost like an <coughs> informal contract with your customer. You're saying, at the end of iteration one, you will run through these tests, and they will, uh, they will pass. And then maybe, of course, they'll run more tests and they'll discover, oh, I forgot to tell you that uh, you should never be allowed to create an account name checking. It's a reserved name. Okay? They, they forgot this detail, but it's really part of the user story. It, so you need to have a test case for it, uh, acceptance test for it. You need to go back and refine the user story for the next iteration. Okay? So uh, this is, I promise you that I'm going to show you acceptance test. Uh, this is what you should think through. Uh, essentially, how are you going to test it when it's done? How will you know that it's done? And try to put down on paper some concrete uh, examples. The important part here is that the human mind uh, can only go so far thinking in the abstract for these use cases, very generic. Okay? The moment you go down to detail, uh, that's when some of the corner cases come up. Uh, or it's more likely that you're going to spot the, the corner cases. Questions? Okay. So, like all of the testing, uh, you should always try to automate it. And in fact, there are tools that uh, try to automate uh, these uh, these acceptance tests. Um, although I have I have personally never uh, never used them. We write mostly developer tests, but there are tools where. Um, the customer is presumed to be a non-programmer, so they have a, a fairly simple interface, maybe to write, uh, you know, Excel tables, spreadsheets with the different input data and what the results should be uh, to present uh, to present test cases, and then you can have some software that runs them uh, automatically. Okay, this is probably not something you'll be actually automating in your um, in your project, but it's important to actually spell out the Acceptance tests because making them concrete helps you refine the user cases. Uh, another way, um, okay, so that, that's what I wanted to tell you about user, uh, user stories or use cases. And I, we want you to have these in your requirement and specification documents. Uh, definitely the user, case, the user stories for iteration one should be there in as much detail as you, uh, as you can actually uh, think through. Uh, and think about that. If you put detail in this stage, it's going to be easier to implement. Uh, and you should also have some user stories about future iterations, perhaps incomplete, maybe just the title and the short description, just so that you know where you're going. And then when you refine this document, um, going into iteration two, we expect you to kind of add more detail to, and more user stories. Okay? But the other thing you should try to do is uh, draw some uh, mock-ups or uh, straw men. So these are typically uh, very useful for the visual parts of your application. Because the user story kind of is good at going through steps, uh, but it's not as good at describing a particular user uh, interface. Let me show you an, an example. So you, you can't read the detail for now. We're going to zoom in in the next slide. But I just want to uh, describe this uh, markup of a user interface at this kind of high level, and then we're going to zoom in. So what this is, it's the, the user interface markup for a chat application. Every section like this here is a screen. Okay, so there are several screens. 
um, four, five, six, seven screens uh, in this application. And these uh, blue arrows, uh, they link buttons with new screens. And essentially, they say, if you click on this button, this is the new screen that pops up. The screens themselves, you will see, have uh, some sketch of the UI elements with some green uh, comments. The screens have uh, titles as well. So let me now zoom in a little bit. Hopefully you can see this. This is the upper left part of the previous diagram. So this, you can see that there's two tabs, contact and search. And for the contact, you have these kind of different icons available. Um, Busy, do not disturb, not connected. Um, message chat. If you click on the message, uh, it opens the message uh, screen. And then again, you have the buttons, the icons, um, the presentation. Okay, this looks like a, a not very uh, carefully done uh, markup, but actually, it's it's very good. If you start looking at the details, you can study this for 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 a few minutes and get a pretty good idea how it's going to look how the flow is going to be, where you can go from here to there. And uh, it's actually a very cheap way to iterate on the UI. Okay? As we said, the first iteration is going to give the custom site concrete to get the feeling how it works. Okay? Writing one on paper, okay? this is not trivial to build because there's a lot of care to drawing the, uh, the icons and such. So it'll take, it'll take maybe an hour. Uh, to build one of these, but that's a lot cheaper than building your first iteration of UI with CSS and HTML and all that. And the customer can pretty much say, oh no, I don't want this. Uh, this is too confusing. I want to be able to go from here to there. Um, okay. These are dialog boxes. You see, these are information uh, icons. If you click, it opens these uh, little pop-up screen. There's a lot of information here. So I would urge you to, uh, to start to put together some of these, especially for the first iteration. For future iterations, you already have a UI that you evolve. The customer can see something. Uh, but this, this is actually something very, very useful. Any, any questions about this? Um, I have seen UI designers who uh, maybe they don't do it by uh, a pencil and paper like here. They are pretty good at using Photoshop. Um, at building these mockups of UIs. I mean, they look like screenshots of an existing UI. You're convinced they actually built the UI and took a screenshot. No, they're just very good at using Photoshop with uh, tabs, icons, and just drag and put them together and make it look like, wow, this is uh, exist this exists already. Are there any good online resources for uh, creating mockups? Uh, the question is if there are online resources for creating mockups. I, I do not know. I won't be surprised, but I do not know. If you search and find things, uh, please post it on Piazza. Uh, this is actually a, a good question to always ask yourself. What are the tools that I can use to support a particular uh, process here? And I will, I will show you some when I know, but here uh, I don't. Let me just summarize, and then I'll let you uh, um, fill in the, the survey, the, the, the feedback, OK? So for requirements, OK, the bottom line is you need to figure out what they want, and you need to write it down in a format that's good enough for the customer to, to validate that you understood what they want and for the developers to move on and design. So I would like you to use uh, user stories and this markup of interfaces in your project. Let us uh, stop here. And then if you go to the uh, class web page, here on the uh, left, there's a link to a feedback form. Okay? And you have to log in with your berkeley.edu account. And it should look like something like this. Okay. Um, so try to submit it. You have to submit it before, well, let's say in, in 10 minutes or so. Any questions? Class web page. On the left side panel, bottom link, <coughs> lecture feedback form, login berkeley.edu. And, and I should say these are not anonymous, but only because I want to give you the points 
I really hope that you'll be um, speaking your mind here because I, I need this feedback. The other thing is only people who are in lecture can fill them in, okay? So uh, I consider it dishonest to fill this from your uh, dorm room. It's a side panel on the class homepage, the bottom link, lecture feedback form. 